Uh, and uh, when we talk about language changing, what's actually happening is that there's some, it's kind of like species changing. There's a mixture of all sorts of dialects and the, the mix changes over time, either because of conquest or uh, some political change or boundaries are drawn in a different place or uh, uh, you know, some kind of commercial interchange or whatever. The, the mixture of these things changes over time and you, know, you, you take a look at it a few centuries apart, it looks like there's a different language. But what's happened is, what, what happens is that be, it, between generations, there are usually small changes having to do with uh, other influences from the outside and so on. And these things are cumulative. Sometimes they lead to pretty dramatic changes. I mean, within a couple of generations, a language can have a, can change structurally in quite dramatic ways. And of course, in say, lexicon, you know, the words of the language, well, that's a different matter altogether. So when technology develops, you get a whole new vocabulary. But if you were in France in the 12th century and you understood all the nuances of language, could you have predicted how these various languages would have evolved over time? No, it's totally impossible. I mean, is it's it, a, but is it is it partially random? It's not so much that it's random. I mean, it's not actually random. I, for all we know, it might be completely deterministic. There's just too many factors involved. It's like you know, it's like predicting the weather. There's just too many things going on. Uh, the uh, human life is a pretty complicated affair, and, uh, and uh, now culture, we, we, our culture is uh, speakers of English can be misled by this. English is relatively homogeneous. You can go a long way in the United States. You know, I mean, I just came from Boston, and I understand everybody in Portland and uh, Seattle and so on. But uh, that's not true of most of the world. Most of the world, uh, language areas, uh, language that you can get very different languages pretty close by. And much of the world is what we would call multilingual. The closer I get to the border between France and Germany, would the closer the languages become? Yeah, well, in particular, if you go from, say, Paris to Rome, as you go toward the Italian border, it starts to sound more, more like Italian. And at some point, it becomes Italian. And there's, there isn't, in fact, I mean, up, by now, there's, you know, there's enough national unity and so on, so you can really find the border. But if you go back a little ways, there was no border. It was just, a, I, I wouldn't say continuum, it was just constant changes and fluctuations and variations. And you started speaking one thing in one place, another thing in another place, and they're not mutually intelligible often. But along the way, there's just all sorts of changes. Now, with the rise of national states, and especially national communications and national education systems and all of these things, which is a pretty modern phenomenon, uh, then you get what we call national languages. Now, as I say, English is unusual. Uh, the reason, if you, if, uh, after all, you go to pre-colonial times, there were just hundreds of thousands, probably, of different languages spoken in what's now called the United States. Well, through the destruction of the indigenous population, and it was real destruction, kind of genocidal, and the conquest by speakers of basically one group, uh, you ended up having a large homogeneous language. But how can anybody have predicted that? I mean, it had to do with the invention of guns and, you know, uh, whole political conquest and all sorts of things. And that's pretty much what human history is.